Hi, tonight's story is one that was told to me when I was a young girl by my grandparents. My grandmother lived not too far away from where these crimes took place and my grandfather was away at war. He was based in Darwin at the time that Darwin was bombed by the Japanese. He was also uh, in New Guinea serving there. So he wasn't home here to protect my grandmother from anything bad. My grandmother was worried for her sisters at the time. And that's why I remember the story, because they spoke about it. So I looked into it because, well, I'd actually forgotten it, to be quite honest. But then I was researching something else and it came up. So I delved into it again. And the purpose behind this is the same as any purpose I put behind any of my videos to be educated about who some of these people were, a reminder that they lived, a reminder of what their dreams were or what they might have accomplished, just to honour them and remember them. And of course I have to touch on him, the person that committed the crime, but it's not him that, he's not who I want you to remember. So I hope I do the three ladies justice and um, we'll see how we go. Thank you. Melbourne, 1942. Australia was at war in Europe and we were getting ready to fight the Japanese on our own shores. The women of Melbourne, however, were living in fear. Fear of someone known as the Brown Out Strangler. His real name was Edward Leonsky. 1941, Pearl Harbor is bombed by the Japanese. At the same time the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, they bombed Hong Kong and they bombed the Philippines. Australia was warned to prepare for attack. On the 8th of February, Singapore fell to Japan. So Australia was getting slightly worried and uh, we were asking the United States and Canada to help us out with some troops. Prime Minister Curtin asked for that help on the 18th. On the 19th of February, the Japanese bombed Darwin. And for the course of the next two weeks, they continued to bomb Darwin 10 times in total. We were told to have a brownout, which meant basically covering your windows of a night time, using minimal electrical lighting of a night time, and covering, if you had to go out at night in your car, cover the car lights. This was obviously to avoid an air raid. Prime Minister John Curtin asked President Roosevelt for some help, and he sent help. He sent help in the form of General MacArthur, and 15,000 American troops. So on the 24th of March, they arrived in Melbourne. They were greeted with a parade and cheering Australians. The soldiers set up camp at Royal Park, which was close to, well, next door to the uh, Royal Melbourne Zoo. They needed to set up tents because there was obviously no buildings there at the time for them to live in. So they did. They set up a whole heap of tents. The Australians welcomed the Americans, but mm, the Australian men not so much. <laughs> My grandfather told me stories about the Americans coming here to Australia in their fancy uniforms with their American accents, their chocolates, their nylons, trying to take the Australian women. It didn't really work because a lot of the Australian women were already married or indeed were going out with some Australian diggers. So I don't really think the Australians had much to worry about. So as I say, the Americans were welcome to Australia. However, one of the Americans that came, hmm, not so welcome. Edward Leonsky was born one of six children to both John and Amelia Leonsky. By all accounts, it was a pretty abusive childhood that he had. Both parents were alcoholics. His mother had schizophrenia and bipolar. Being an alcoholic obviously made that a hell of a lot worse. She spent a lot of time in New York's Bellevue Asylum. 
the children were basically left to their own devices which got his brothers into trouble and arrested on a few occasions. He had one brother that sadly had some fairly serious mental health issues and that put him into a mental institution for the rest of his days. He had a sister called Helen as well. When Eddie left high school in 1933, he completed a secretarial course and he finished tops in his secretarial class. He had some clerical jobs after that, but uh, then he got a job at Christine Brothers Incorporated as Superior Food Markets as a delivery boy. Uh, And after that, a few years after that, he got called up to serve in the US Army, obviously because of the events around Pearl Harbor, etc., and troops were needed. He was stationed at the 52nd Battalion in San Antonio, Texas, and he was later shipped to Australia to assist with the war effort here. He was stationed at Camp Pell. He was one of the cooks at Camp Pell. When Eddie arrived in Melbourne, he started his heavy drinking again. He was accused by a woman of trying to take advantage of her in her St Kilda flat. It was a matter of he said, she said again. And despite the fact he'd been in trouble back home in America for a similar thing and nothing was done about it, he was slapped on the wrist. He was put into uh, the lockup for 30 days. And when he was released from lockup, he just started doing the same thing again. So it seems although the army was somewhat aware of his drinking and violent nature, when under the influence of alcohol, not much was done about it. So this unfortunately leads us to our first episode, our first crime. Eddie was out and about on the night of the 2nd of May when he left the hotel he was drinking at in St Kilda and made his way towards Albert Park. It's said that he was more than likely trying to catch a cab or a tram back to Camp Pell. And that is when he came upon the lovely Ivy McLeod. Ivy was a lovely lady who had a hard life she was in a loveless marriage and she wasn't treated too well she couldn't have children in fact she lost a child and in the end i guess she just had enough and she divorced her husband fair enough then she started her new life she had a job working for one of the ladies in town as a lady's helper which i guess these days you'd call a a maid or a you know i guess a maid Um, and she seemed happy she would go out with her friends which she happened to do on the night of the 2nd of May and she had a fiance Patrick who was an aircraft worker the night that Ivy met Eddie she was out with her girlfriends and she decided that she would call in to see Patrick on her way home so so she did she called in to see Patrick she stayed there until around about 2 a.m. I think uh, she got she had got to him at 11 o'clock and left about 2 a.m. Uh, she wanted to go home fair enough uh, he didn't Patrick didn't walk her to the tram which I guess was unfortunate but it was really as you can see from the map it was 10 minute walk from Patrick's home to where the trams and the taxis were So that's what Ivy was doing that night. Completely innocent night. She hadn't been drinking, anything like that. She'd just been to see her fiancé and wanted to go home. So she got to the hotel and I'm assuming from the evidence I gathered that she was near near the alcove or coming possibly coming through the alcove to make her way to the taxi cab. And that is when Eddie came upon her. So he came upon the alcove around the same time that she was obviously coming out of it. And that's when the crime occurred. Now I won't go into details in respect for Ivy, but needless to say, Eddie took her life that night. He treated her body with disrespect and he did leave her in a rather compromised position. And he knew that she'd be found that way. And she was. She was found by the publican of the hotel at dawn on the 3rd of May. Uh, This man, the publican, did see a man leave and recognised him as a US soldier. So he must have only just missed the whole thing. Uh, The US soldier took off and 
the man called the police and so on and so forth. So the police were on the lookout for an American soldier, but they didn't know for sure if he had something to do with the murder, but given the evidence, it was likely. Shortly after Ivy's murder, the US Army headquarters in Melbourne had taken a phone call. They took a phone call from a man who declined to identify himself, but he was said to have told them about the dame who was murdered the other night. Look for a guy who walks on his hands. The caller hung up and the police were stumped. Amazingly, a policeman named Detective Adam, who happened to be working on the case as well, he was at the Royal Park Hotel one evening. He was having beer with a few mates and an American serviceman was holding court at the bar, making an unholy concoction of painkillers, a tomato sauce, beer and whiskey and sculling the contents. He then got up onto the bar and started walking around on his hands. Detective Adam said, if this is not the bloke, I'll walk to Burke. Let's pick him up but he was overruled by a superior who felt police needed something more solid to question an off-duty American soldier. So they had to let the brownout strangler slip away. This leads us to May 8th, 1942 and the beautiful Pauline Thompson. Pauline Thompson was a married lady. Her husband was a policeman and he worked in Bendigo She also had two children. They were both adopted, a little boy aged seven and a little girl aged four. And Pauline had a full-time job working at International Harvester. And she also had a nighttime job working at the radio station 3AW. And in between all of that, she kept herself busy helping uh, organize certain events for the American soldiers to make them feel at home. So as fate would have it, on this particular evening, Pauline was meant to meet another young American soldier at the servicemen's club. He didn't show up, so she got a little annoyed, but another American soldier had started to talk to her and pay her some attention, and he said, hey, let's not worry about it. So she left with that American soldier, and they went to a few hotels, and they ended up at Colin's place which it was only a five minute walk roughly from where Pauline lived. They had a few drinks there, a couple of dances, and Pauline said she needed to go home. The soldier said he would see her to the door. And unfortunately for Pauline, he did. And that soldier turned out to be Eddie. So again, another life taken. She was found the next morning at about 5 a.m. by a security guard who was checking some buildings in the area. He found her at the bottom of the stairs just outside of her home. The police were called and yet another case for them to solve. So this leads us to the last of Eddie's crimes, thank goodness, and that was the beautiful Gladys Hosking. Now Gladys had originally come to Melbourne from Perth She wanted to make her way in the world. She wanted to focus on her career. But her dream, she aspired to be a movie star and a singer. But in the meantime, she had a job working at the Melbourne University in the chemistry department. She worked there with another lady and their job was to do the filing and organise everything in a clerical way. The night that the crime took place, Gladys had left with her friend from the School of Chemistry and was making her way home up to Park Street when a young American soldier, who was dripping wet because it was raining, uh, asked to share her umbrella and told her that he was lost and didn't know how to get back to Camp Pell. She helped him to get back to Camp Pell well. She helped him to get near to Camp Pell because apparently according later to evidence in the courts she started to sing and that infuriated the young soldier Eddie and he took her life in a ditch out front of some homes in Gatehouse Street. She was later found the next morning and the police again had another murder to solve. And funnily enough, the place where she her life was taken looks almost the same to this day. So, 
let's get back to how they caught Eddie. Some other ladies came forward after this murder and said that they had been approached by an American soldier the same night that this had happened to Gladys and a lineup took place at Camp Pell. Eddie was pointed out as being the man in question. He was arrested. The police went to Eddie's tent, investigated it and saw that there was mud on the cot which matched the mud found at the crime scene. And then there was the testimony of an Australian soldier. The Australian soldier was standing guard that night at Camp Pell when Eddie returned. And he recalled that Eddie was very confused, very drunk, and didn't know where his tent was. He didn't even realise he was at Camp Pell. He kept asking the soldier, where's Camp Pell? I'm lost. The soldier told him, you're here, mate. Like, and why are you covered in mud? Eddie didn't say anything and just took off and went back to his tent. But the Australian soldier remembered that very vividly. So when the police asked, he gave a description and he also pointed out Eddie as being that soldier covered in mud. There was also the testimony of another soldier who said Eddie had actually confessed to the murders to him, but he was afraid to come forward because he was scared of Eddie as a lot of the other people were too. They said when he was drunk, he could be quite violent. So the general court martial took place. All evidence was heard. And at the end of the day, Eddie was judged and uh, convicted of the murders and sentenced to hang. So the gallows were prepared at Pentridge Prison and Eddie was told of his fate. And apparently Eddie laughed about it and said he was due for a facelift and things like that. Very odd behaviour. Eddie spent the last of his days in the Old Melbourne Watch House, which is next door to the Old Melbourne Jail. He was then taken from the Watch House to Pentridge Prison and he met his fate. His life was taken that day and for all intent and purposes justice was served. At the end of the day, families were left shattered. His family, but mostly the families of the three ladies whose lives were taken. There was Patrick, the fiancé to Ivy, left shattered. There was the husband of Pauline and the children. Then there was Gladys and her family over in Perth, who actually learnt of her death through the newspapers. So all round, a sad story. Eddie's body was buried originally in Springvale Cemetery in Victoria. They moved it later on to Ipswich. And then after that, the Americans wanted him back and he is now buried at the Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. And so to end this, I hope that these beautiful ladies, Ivy, Pamela and Gladys, are all resting in peace somewhere, knowing that they'll never be forgotten. <laughs>